Okay, well, I, my name is Larry Goldbetter. I'm the president of the National Writers Union, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our new home. Uh, we moved here recently after spending many years on University Place. And uh, we're here to talk about the Google Book Settlement, the proposed Google Book Settlement. Uh, I really want to welcome everybody on both sides of the table. Uh, this is clearly one of the biggest issues facing writers today among many. And uh, it's about the future of books, it's about the future of writing. And uh, thousands of voices have been raised about it all around the world. Uh, from the governments of France and Germany to our little National Writers Union. And, uh, you know, there are, there, some of the voices have uh, spoken to antitrust violations. Some of the, like, you know, like uh, Microsoft, some of the voices have spoken to privacy rights, like the ACLU. Uh, but the, the uniqueness of, of today's uh, presentation is that it's about writers. What's in it for writers? And uh, we have a very distinguished group to uh, start the discussion and then we really encourage and welcome everybody's participation afterwards, uh, after the initial presentations. Uh, first I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Paul Aiken, who is the Executive Director of the Authors Guild, has been for 17 years, and the Authors Guild is a party to the settlement. Uh, next to him, James Grimmelman, uh, is a professor at New York State, uh, at New York Law School, and uh, has been one of the most consistent voices uh, trying to explain the intricacies of the settlement and one of, probably one of the most read uh, blogs on on the settlement. And uh, next to him is Lin Chu. Lin Chu is uh, an author, a literary agent, and a member of the New York State Bar. And uh, she was, in fact, our co-counsel in the uh, Google One up to the first court hearing, uh, along with uh, ASJA. Uh, those are our three main speakers. Now, the National Writers Union is providing the place, but we're not the only host. We're hosting this along with the American Society of Journalists and Authors, and I'd like to introduce Sally Shannon, the president, and Michael Capabianco here, is the immediate past president of Science Fiction Writers, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. And last but certainly not least in our book is Edward Hasbrook uh, speaking for the union and he is our national uh, book division co-chair. So the general plan for this discussion is that we want to hear from our three main guests uh, uh, starting with Paul, and then James, and then Lynn, Lynn. Uh, you know, approximately 15 minute presentations, and then uh, maybe the, uh, another five minutes if people want to speak to something that somebody else said. And then the representatives of the three writers groups are going to make short presentations, around five minute presentations, and ask a question to one of the, our main guests. And at that point, we want to open it up to the floor. So I think this is going to be something special and uh, something useful to writers in the days ahead. So, Paul? Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to be here today. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to, uh, to, uh, to address the, the axis of opposition to the, uh, to the Google Book Settlement. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to introduce, introduce a few people from the uh, Authors Guild who are here with me. Uh, Dan Constantine, Dan for the way you're in. General Counsel of the Authors Guild, very involved in, of course, all the negotiations on the settlement. Uh, to her left is Anita Ford, Director of Legal Services, also very involved throughout the uh, settlement process. And uh, to Jan's right 
is, uh, is Michael Healy. He's the executive director designate for the Book Rights Registry. And I believe, I want to see Sandy Long is here. Yeah, she is. And Sandy, she's uh, director of marketing for the, uh, for the Authors Guild. Um, and so I thought I'd start with some background, see how we got to where we are today. Uh, as, uh, as many of you know, in 2004, Google announced its library project, and at first it was fine with us and with everyone else because they were going to scan in libraries, library books that were uh, out of copyright, public domain books, and then display those books uh, online, which of course is a fine activity as far as we're concerned. Then in December of 2004, they shifted gears and said, we're going to start scanning at some libraries uh, everything, in print, out of print, in copyright, out of copyright, we'll scan it all. And I was going to do this particularly at the University of Michigan, which has some six or seven million volumes of books. Uh, Google thought this was a fair use, they said, because they would show to end users only snippets, three or four line snippets of text would be available on the internet in response to search requests at, at Google. Of course, Google was going to make money on this because this is an activity of Google.com, not their you know, charitable organization, Google.org. They were going to sell ads to go alongside those snippets. Uh, we didn't view this as, uh, as a fair use. Uh, we thought it was, it was copyright infringement. We thought it was massive copyright infringement because, of course, to, to display those snippets, they had to scan entire books. Uh, we, ev we don't even buy that showing snippets it is a fair use. Uh, it, it really depends as a case-by-case -case analysis, as many of you know, uh, on fair use. Um, beyond that, Google was providing to the library. So it was in, in its contract with the University of Michigan, it was going to turn over to Michigan uh, the, the stacks in digital form, six or seven million volumes of books back to the, back to the library. And the only restriction on the library on the University of Michigan was that they had to use it within the bounds of copyright. Well, as we saw this, this was far beyond the bounds of copyright. And just you know, scanning originally, making an extra copy for the library, <laughs> handing it over and saying using it within the bounds of copyright, we're way outside of where copyright is. And then they said, and you can share with other academic libraries. Of course, still, somehow or another, within the bounds of copyright. Uh, to us, this was plain. This was, uh, this was uh, clearly copyright infringement, and so we sued. In September of 2005, here in New York, the Southern District of New York, we brought up an action uh, styled as a class action uh, against Google for copyright infringement. One month later, uh, five major publishers, backed by the Association of American Publishers, also brought suit uh, in a uh, you know, similar suit, uh, but not a class action. It's brought as a, a typical uh, individual action. Um, and then it proceeded the way litigation proceeds for about eight months. Uh, there was lots of discovery, uh, more than a million documents were turned over, uh, you know, the wheels were in motion, and then uh, we had our first settlement conference uh, with Google in May of 2006. And we proposed to Google, and this was our proposal, not Google's proposal, we proposed to Google that a way around this was to allow Google to show more than snippets for out-of-print books, to show entire pages, entire books, so long as they cut authors and publishers in. Uh, that was the, the, basic, you know, the basic deal. And uh, you know, so our position was cut us in or cut it out. And, uh, and we began negotiating on that basis uh, in May of, of 2006. Um, in relatively short order, we got uh, the basic terms worked out. And then it took a lot of work to, 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 to work through all the details. And some 30 months later, we announced the, uh, uh, the initial settlement of the case. Um, the initial proposed settlement of the case. Uh, the four big things that authors need to know about the settlement is that, uh, first, it treats in-print books and out-of-print books entirely differently. And that's because a cardinal rule for us was to make sure we did not disrupt existing commercial markets. It was about creating a new market for out-of-print books. We didn't want to disrupt existing commercial markets. So the way this was done is that out-of-print books, by default, would be in the displays that I'll soon describe. In-print books, just the opposite, by default, would not be in these displays at all, unless the author and publisher expressly agreed to have it, uh, have it displayed. So out-of-print books, by default, are in, and that would allow, but either the author or the publisher can say, you know, turn off the uses I'll describe uh, in, for out-of-print books. 
and for in-print books by default are off. Second big principle, the uses are domestic only, that is United States only, displays are to be made uh, in the US only, and Google is to use technological means to, to try to assure that. Uh, third, images for the most part are not part of the settlement. This is about text, not images. So images won't be displayed except in certain circumstances, which we can get to later if, if you're interested. Fourth, the settlement allows for the creation of this new nonprofit, a book rights registry. Now the idea of the book rights registry is that as a natural re result of the claims process and a class action, all sorts of authors and publishers will come forward and claim their books, and there'll be all sorts of rights data generated. Uh, we knew a few things about that data. We knew, uh, we knew we didn't want it to be lost. We knew it was valuable. Uh, we knew that we didn't want Google to have control of it. We wanted authors and publishers to have control of it. Uh, and so part of the function of the Book Rights Registry is to be the legal owner of that contact information uh, that matches up authors to particular titles and publishers to particular titles. The other part of the role, the other big role for the Book Rights Registry is to oversee the settlement. That is to act as the, the authors and publishers uh, the, the representative to, to make sure that, uh, that Google does what it's supposed to be doing under the settlement oversees Google, and that the instructions that the authors and publishers give, uh, give to Google through the Book Rights Registry are carried out. Those are the responsibilities of the Book Rights Registry. The Book Rights Registry is a nonprofit, and following the, the ASCAP model and the model of countless rights organizations, it'll be half author representatives and half publisher representatives, no Google representatives. Google's <coughs> role in this is what Google's role should be, to provide money and get out of the way. So, you know, that's, that's what we want them to do. Give money, get out of the way. It's not, it, they have no say uh, in the functioning of the Book Rights Registry. Um, as part of its, its duties to, uh, to oversee the settlement, uh, the registry has rights to audit Google. It can audit Google's financial books to make sure that Google is faithfully reporting exactly what licensing is going on and paying the Book Rights Registry and the rights holders appropriately. But beyond that, one of our big concerns uh, was the security of all these scans that, uh, that Google was creating. Uh, you know, initially, there was no security, uh, no, nothing that, that we knew of, nothing that rights holders had control of. So a big part of the settlement is a security protocol that was negotiated on, on our behalf by computer security experts that Google has to live up to. And if they don't live up to it and they leak meaningful amounts of data, there's substantial financial penalties they have to pay. And the, the Book Rights Registry has the right to go in and audit Google's security to make sure they're living up to that security protocol. But beyond that, the, the libraries, now remember, the University of Michigan getting back a, a, a copy of six or seven million volumes of books, um, how's that being secured? Well, under the settlement, the University of Michigan also has to sign on to that security protocol, a very similar security protocol, has to pay similar penalties, and the Book Rights Registry has the authority to go in and audit the university's, University of Michigan and other participating libraries uh, security to make sure they're looking up to it. Um, the displays that would be allowed uh, under the settlement of, on, on approval are, are four types. One is the public access display. Now this would allow uh, any public library building in the United States, if they, you know, if they take us up on it, could have a terminal where you could view the entirety of the database of Remember out-of-print books, except for the smattering of in-print books that people uh, affirmatively opt into these programs. So every public library building in the United States can have a free view-only terminal to view the entirety of the out-of-print database of books. If they want to print out, and, the, and it's been enabled so there's a paper print system set up at that library, uh, they'll be able to do so, pay a per page fee to print out, and that'll generate revenue, of course. Um, and that revenue gets shared with rights holders in a way I'll describe in a moment. So that's uh, the, the first use, public access use. It's a pay per print model to the extent prints are made, or it can be free if people are just at that terminal and viewing only. Uh, the second use that would be allowed is what's called a, what Google calls a preview use. This is like Amazon search inside the book. You can see it at Google Book Search now for imprint books that are part of a separate program. Um, and uh, the, the preview allows users to see, generally, up to 20% of a book. So you go and you do your search at Google, uh, you, do, you search Gettysburg Address, 
Uh, snippets will come up from out of print books uh, that'll have Gettysburg Address. If one looks of interest to you, you click on that, and that'll take you to a preview of the book. That um, uh, and they'll, you'll be cut out at twenty at twenty percent, um, except for certain you, certain types of books you can't see that much. There can be ads that run alongside those previews. To the extent that people click on those ads, revenue is generated, and that revenue is shared with rights holders. Uh, the third use that's allowed would be if uh, uh, if so someone's at a computer terminal in the U.S. has done a preview, and uh, they want to see the entirety of the thing, they'll be able to purchase the right to view online. And it's not a download, it's not a PDF, it's not an a e-book that you can read on your Kindle. Uh, view online, a, a consumer online edition. You pay a price, the author sets the price if the rights have reverted to the author, the author has the sole right to set the price for that book, or they can let Google set the algorithm uh, set the algorithmic price for them. Um, that's the consumer model, and of course, revenues get shared with the uh, uh, with rights holders. And the fourth is institutional subscriptions, and this would allow, particularly colleges and universities, we think will be the biggest market for this, to uh, to purchase the right to view for a year uh, the, the database of out of print books. So, it'll be a flat fee based on the number of students and faculty members uh, at the university pay that and view the entirety of it, and the money gets shared with rights holders in a way I'll describe in just a second. So uh, let's talk the flow of the money for a moment. Uh, the money, in all cases, from the paper print, from the, uh, 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 from the Google ads, from the consumer online editions, institutional subscriptions, Google collects the money first and keeps 37%, and then passes on 63% to the rights holders as represented by the book rights registry. The Book Rights Registry then keeps an administrative fee, which hasn't been set yet. The uh, settlement agreement says it has to be reasonable, but we can't set it until we know how much money is flowing into the Book Rights Registry and what the actual expenses are. But the Book Rights Registry keeps an administrative fee and pays the rest to rights holders. The amount it pays to rights holders for, to authors depends on the status of the book. So for out-of-print books where rights have re reverted, 100% of the rights holder revenue goes to authors. For out-of-print books where rights have not reverted, then it's a 50-50 split, author and publisher in most cases, 50-50 split, uh, money going directly from the registry to the author, from registry to the publisher. Um, uh, for older books, those published first before 1987, uh, the split is 65-35 in favor of the author. The theory here is older contracts often did not have grants of electronic rights to publishers. Uh, some of the older contracts, though, did. They had granted data storage and retrieval right, and publishers argued, well, that's, that's what this looks like, data storage and retrieval right. Um, and so we had to negotiate something, and what we came up with was 6535 in favor of the author for pre-1987 books. Um, and the, uh, for pre-1987 out-of-print books. And the final category is for in-print books, and in the, what we think will be the unusual case where in-print books are part of the settlement displays, then uh, uh, the publisher, as you would probably expect, gets 100% of the revenue and then has to share with the author pursuant to the author-publisher contract. Um, I know I'm at my 15 minutes, but I'd like to at least uh, have another five minutes so I can finish up this presentation. Um, uh, the author-publisher procedures are attachment A to the settlement. They have all sorts of important rights for uh, uh, for authors. Uh, uh, one of those is an arbitration right. So if, uh, if it's the rare case where it's an imprint book uh, and uh, the publisher is getting the money and you don't agree with what the publisher is paying you, you say you're not interpreting the contract uh, correctly, you have the right to take the publisher to arbitration. You don't have to pay to go to court. You don't have to have uh, you know, uh, 100,000 extra dollars to go to court. You can pay $300 to go to arbitration under standard arbitration rules, American Arbitration Association, uh, to get an arbitration as to how much money, what your cut of the, of the revenue should be. You also have a right, now we know that often publishers, you send them a, a demand for a reversion of rights and they'll just sit on it. They will not revert rights because it's a low, very low priority for publishers. Uh, so we wanted to have some way to deal with that. And so we came up with this quasi-reversion of rights, an expedited reversion of rights that only has effect within the boundaries of the settlement. So uh, 
so the way this works is you go through your usual reversion demand for to the publisher, it's not afraid, you send your demand, and then at one point in the process, you send a letter to the publisher with a copy to the book rights registry, and that starts the clock running. And if the publisher doesn't respond in, I don't know, it's 90 or 120 days, if the publisher doesn't respond to the book rights registry in that time period, thenceforth, it's author controlled. That means it's as if the rights had reverted within the boundaries of the settlement. So if you get 100% of the revenue, you have 100% of the control. It has no effect outside of the settlement. Like many things about the settlement, it only has effect within the boundaries of the settlement. So if you want to uh, republish in a traditional way, uh, you, would, uh, you would still have to get your traditional reversion of rights from the, uh, from the publisher. Um, let's see, you will also, as part of this process, so you, the way to get started out with all this is you go to googlebooksettlement.com and you file a claim and you do this, by, it's typical online stuff. You, uh, username and password, um, then do a search. The best thing to do is search under your name. A bunch of books will come up with your name, and, and, and some of them will be yours, and some will be those by authors with similar names. You check the boxes that are yours, and, and you make your claim. Um, eventually, once you've done that, you get to a rights management screen. And this is how you're allowed to instruct Google through eventually the book rights registry, when the book rights registry is up and running, uh, what you want done with your books. You say, okay, I want to take, I want to take part in uh, all these various uses, display uses I described, uh, I'll leave those on. Or, no, I don't trust the system, it seems fishy to me, I'll turn all of those off. So, no displays by Google, uh, period. Um, and then, you know, a, a couple of years down the road, when well, people are getting checks and you trust the system more, they say, okay, wait a minute, I'll turn this back on. You go back to your rights management screen. You say, yes, I'll turn on. Uh, I'll, I'll turn on my, uh, uh, my uses. Um, so that's, that's what you'll be able to do with the rights management screen. You'll also be able to instruct Google to remove the books, which means that they have to remove the digital versions that they, the, uh, the digital scans they've done. Um, uh, and, and you can, you know, but that's irreversible. We don't recommend that. And since this is supposed to be about uh, recommendations for authors, that, you know, the best thing for most authors to do is stay in the settlement, and then, because that leaves your options open. You can decide whether you want Google to display or not display. You can tell them to remove, and they're legally, contractually obligated to remove your book, uh, or, or not remove. It leaves your options open. You are always able to turn off all uses, every single use by Google, and give exclusive rights to a publisher who's, who's now interested in your out of print book. It'll allow your book to be re rediscovered, It'll allow you to earn some income, how much we don't know, and no one will know until this thing is, is fully up and running. Uh, but it puts all the control in your hands and a level of control that authors have never ever had over their books before. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Jay. Uh, I'm, you know, kind of look to me to explain the settlement and to discuss it, but actually on this panel, I'm now massively outclassed in terms of understanding of the settlement. So I'm going to give just a few broader comments about why I've got interested in studying this and how I see my role, and some larger societal public interest copyright system thoughts that might be of interest to you as authors as you consider what your position is towards the settlement, whether you want to opt in, opt out, object, uh, or simply sit back and decide it doesn't concern you. Uh, I hope it won't be the last of those. Um, so, I come at this basically as an academic, and that means two things. First, I have a commitment to trying to get this right. I want to advance the causes of truth and justice and to give my sort of best understanding of the settlement and its effects for authors, for readers, for libraries, for society. And I'd say I'm probably on that score of mixed opinions, but generally skeptical. But I also have a larger commitment to the process of seeking truth and justice, that commitment to a certain kind of conversation about having an open dialogue over the issues and the hope that, as I discuss my views, others will point out the errors in my thoughts to me and vice versa, and that we'll gradually converge on a better understanding. So to that end, I'd say my position is very strongly pro-involvement. I want people to understand the settlement well, I want them to understand how it affects them, and I want them to think about how it might affect the society we live in, and to act with knowledge based on that. 
So I've been involved with students at New York Law School in creating a website devoted to discussion of the settlement. It's called thepublicindex.org. Uh, if you search for public index, you'll find it very easily. It has an annotated version of the settlement, clause by clause. It also has a very extensive collection of documents from the lawsuit and links to extensive commentary about it. Everything from Jonathan Band's 100-page uh, treatise on the settlement's details to op-eds on all points of view around it. I've been blogging extensively and will continue to blog about developments in the case, <coughs> reporting on them, so passing along new points of view, new developments in, in the case that's at my blog at laboratorium.net. And we held a conference back in October to discuss it called Ideas for Digitize. Had a number of panels, uh, some of them featuring familiar faces from the debates, uh, and the videos of that are also online. So that's sort of the larger information presentation point of view, and I refer you, please, look at those resources if you have further questions after this meeting. Now, just a few thoughts about in the settlement itself and my involvement with it. It's been intensely enjoyable for me, in part because I've had the pleasure of working with so many writers on this, and for the settlement or against it, they're always remarkably articulate, and it's just a pleasure to see them trading their views, sometimes very barbed ones, but it's always well expressed. I would say that you have maybe three big things to think about in the settlement here. These are these go beyond simply just the which particular rights are involved, how are the revenues split, what control will I have or not have, what will happen. The first of them is the possibility of the expansion of outlets. This is opening up, to some extent, a new and not very much tried model in publishing. And to that extent, whether it comes through the settlement or through some other mechanism or through other business ventures launched inspired by this, it's another opportunity for getting your book seen by a reading public. It joins plenty of other kinds of publication, plenty of other digital initiatives, but this is an interesting and very, in some ways, appealing possibility for getting books to the reading public. Now, under the settlement itself, there's a very substantial question about what the defaults are. What are the rules that would apply if, as members of this class, you become part of the settlement? Those cover the question of how Google will display your books, how much control you will have, how you split with publishers the control of the books and the royalties from them, and which other uses Google might make that potentially don't come with compensation. So there are plenty of objections and plenty of arguments in favor on this, but it is first and foremost essentially a different kind of business opportunity. And so I think you might be best off starting by evaluating the question of how much money do I stand to make in immediate one-time payments under the settlement? That's the $60 per book or $15 per insert number. Although, of course, that will be split with the publishers in ratios that depend upon the status of the book. It also involves the potential for revenue over the longer term, although the success of that is going to depend a great deal on both how many others opt into this and how popular the service provides. And it's hard to predict all that up front. The other thing I'd point out here is that this was a lawsuit over scanning, over the take, making digital copies of the books, putting them in the search engine, and hanging on to and using the digital copies in various ways, just giving them back to the libraries. The settlement is about settling that lawsuit, but also about establishing much larger commercial programs for selling books. And in some ways, that's a much bigger deal. I was largely ignoring the settlement when it consisted just of the former. Uh, and to think about this just being somebody scanning my books without permission is to miss the bigger picture. Uh, I would recommend that you think again, what is the deal that is offered here? Is this a good one for me? Is it a good one for authors? Is it good for society? And focus somewhat less on, would we have won this lawsuit if it went to trial? I happen to think, based on my own academic views of fair use, that no, you wouldn't have. But in any event, it would be best not to be distracted, say, by anger at Google for scanning without permission in evaluating the pros and cons of the deal on the table. The second large thought here 
is the question of the alignment of interests between authors and readers here. There is one very large sense in which there are two fiercely opposed camps, both of whom have concerns about the settlement. There are the advocates for readers and libraries and the public who think that the settlement is too stingy. It puts too many security restrictions on how the books will use. It restricts copy and paste too much. It limits libraries to one free terminal. And then on the other side, there's the copyright owner constituency, some of them who objected to the settlement from that side, saying the settlement is too generous. It puts too few security restrictions on the books. It allows too much copy and paste. And the one terminal per public library is too much. Now, these are, in some sense, views that are in tension. And what is done to benefit one in modifying the settlement will hurt the other. But there are also very important large ways in which your interests as writers is very much aligned with those of your readers. And it's worth thinking about those. The first is that privacy is a reader issue that affects you. People who are, want to read your book on a sensitive subject but are scared what other people might think, uh, who might be deterred from reading it because they think they're being tracked, are readers you won't have. And we have a system that provides for substantial privacy in some ways. The libraries that keep records and then dispose of them quickly, or bookstores where you pay for cash, those are ways of getting your books to readers with compensation that don't result in tracking information. So there's a group of privacy-concerned authors who filed objections. And their points emphasize the alignment between authors and readers seeking privacy. The second thing is that as authors and readers, we all want good incentives for the creation and distribution of books. That's what gives writers jobs. It's, in another sense, part of how I make my living. And this is about we all lose if there are not a good functioning copyright system. And so that means it has to do both pieces. It has to provide fair compensation. And it has to provide mechanisms for getting those books to readers. If you drop the ball on either side, the whole thing can fall apart. And this is a particular concern in the terms of the settlement it tries to address with orphaned out of print books. These are ones that have not just fallen out of print, but where no one can find the publisher or author, and thus that are unable to be brought back into print. Simply by providing a mechanism to distribute those again that involves collection of revenue and holding it in escrow for the copyright owners if and when they turn up, the settlement does take a substantial step towards trying to fix that gap in the system. And then finally, as authors, we are huge, huge readers. Uh, we ourselves are going to be consumers of the set services offered through this or through any other project for making books more widely available. And thus again, think about yourselves in your, wearing your hats as readers. What do you want there? Finally, there are the large concerns that I think of under the heading of copyright policy. These are, in some ways, the things that got me really interested in studying the settlement. And they're the things that continue to trouble me about it. So the orphan works issue that I just mentioned. The settlement is very exciting in that it makes many orphan works available again. But it's also worrisome in that it does so in a way that could potentially, under certain circumstances, disadvantage the authors or copyright owners in them. Uh, if the work is unclaimed, it's not sitting there and no one can at the registry, then it will be out there being sold by default at a price that Google will have had to set. And if that pricing decision goes wrong, there's the danger of undermining the market for it, of making it eventually economically infeasible ever to bring it back into print. Uh, the revised settlement uh, that's uh, brought back in November contains a new unclaimed works fiduciary to address that issue. I have my concerns about whether it goes far enough. Second thought is the question of the structure of the book industry. And this is extraordinarily hard to predict at this point. The transition to digital uh, is going very rapidly. And this seems to be the tipping point for e-readers this year. So it's actually very hard to make substantial predictions about this. The settlement would effectively create Google as a very significant player in making a lot of books available. 
No, it's expected to start with the out of print books, but that would give Google an enormous institutional position to offer an attractive platform for selling books that are in print again, too. And this, there are concerns about plenty of other players in the system. I worry about creating a large, powerful institutional player in this way through a district judge's decision rather than through individual negotiated agreements. And that leads into my final concern, which is really the effects on the legal system of using a class action in this way. Uh, the, the copyright policy questions here. What's the right scope of copyright? What do we do about orphan books? Who has the ability to publish and distribute things electronically? And how should we settle lawsuits over major issues like scanning and searching? It's not clear that these really ought to be resolved through a class action particularly one that has the effect of issuing an enormous number of licenses to a new publisher. That this may not be the appropriate system for doing this, that if something of this sort is to be done in our copyright system, the appropriate governmental body is Congress, which is politically accountable to a great many constituencies and needs to take their interests into account. Uh, Pamela Samuelson, another academic commentator on the settlement, has said in response to the complaint that Congress has sat on its hands on these issues for a great long time, that just because one branch of government is broken, we shouldn't be quick to break another. So these are just sort of large, in some ways, philosophic issues that are somewhat remote from the brass tacks that probably concern you as professional writers. <laughs> but I want to put these out there because I think they get at the kind of big questions that we care about as people who make our living from the word and people who care about a society in which words are valued, their distribution is important to how we live in society and democracy, and who try to live together under a system dedicated to the rule of law. Lynn? All right. Um, it's hard really to know how to begin. It's so complicated. Louder, please. Um, my main issue with this agreement is that I don't believe it's been reviewed properly by corporate counsel. I believe the Authors Guild has been, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's no. Can you stand up, please? That might be good. Is there some kind of, no. Um, I think that this is a real travesty, this agreement. Uh, it's not been reviewed. The crux of the issue with this agreement are the releases and waivers of all of, copy, of all of your interest in copyright, all of your interest in trademark, and all of your adroit morale. What that does is eliminate your uh, ownership, essentially, vis-a-vis -vis Google. Um, this has been glued to what purports to be a business deal. The business deal is incorrectly structured. The registry is taking publisher obligations and costing them to the, to the authors. Those costs are publisher costs, co costs that publishers are, are supposed to be liable for under, <coughs> under every agreement. There are many. Uh, meaning signing up every author onto, agree onto uh, licenses. To do this en masse like this eliminates the entire market process. Every individual who owns a copyright has, their, has a right to negotiate their agreements with a publisher. If you don't like the agreement, you have the irrevocable just right to walk and find and seek another publisher. There are, we are at the brink of the digital era. There's going to be an explosion of online publishers. Um, I'm just really concerned who your corporate counsel was on this. Was it Bonnie and Zach? Oh, uh, we had several lawyers working on this. Uh, uh, Jan's an experienced lawyer, was with uh, News Corporation for many years. Um, I was a litigator before I started at the Law Authors Guild uh, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, Anita Four has uh, many years of experience. Um, the, um, and it wasn't just but us. But what you, you lack here, what you do lack. Sorry, but you, sir, I think you're out of order. Whoa. She was thinking, no, 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 no. I, I asked a question. I just asked if, about the corporate issues here. This document presents massive. <laughs> 
corporate reorganization problems that require um, more than litigation, more than standard book publishing. Um, you've glued a, a business contract to these waivers. What, you, what this essentially creates is a Creative Commons non-attribution license to Google. You've created a registry that has no power because all rights of copyright are waived and released in, in Article 10. Um, there, there are other issues here, uh, you know, having to do with uh, just the trampling of individual rights and their right to in informed consent to any contract that they uh, engage in, enter into. The class action definitely cannot be used for this purpose. It's going to be very interesting. There's not a lot of law on the class action. Class action is a relatively uh, recent device. Um, really, this is an attempt to, uh, to do legislation through the courts. It really can't be done. Um, I, everybody's you know, kind of posed this problem of the orphan issue. I don't believe there is an orphan issue. I think that that is a, a, a really an invention of the lobbyists of Google and other online publishers who, again, are interested in shifting costs from from their obligation to uh, to sign authors up on their agreements, which Google and every online publisher can do very easily, cost free, shifting all these costs uh, and, and burdens. Uh, onto someone else, meaning the owners. This structure costs all of that to owners in the, in, the, in the form of this entity, the registry. I don't believe this registry does anything but foment disputes. Um, the owner of works are very easily obtained. Uh, everybody knows it's either the author or the publisher. We have an entire industry of very cheap paraprofessionals in the $25 range, an hour range to locate permission grantors, um, and uh, there, there, there's just no reason to have this entity which is invading everybody's privacy and demanding everybody's contracts to be submitted to it. To uh, it, it, This is a big administrative cost that is being shifted from publishers to authors. Furthermore, you're completely eliminated eliminating the factor of market competition. It, it, there, it, it has cost Google $10 to scan each title. Anybody can put their, their work online. There is uh, copy protection. That's it. I mean, this publisher is being licensed all of literature for an off the top of essentially 50%. Uh, that's just when, when you include the cost of the registry, which is a publisher cost. Uh, that's just an outrageously bad deal as a financial matter. And you do not want to give your rights up to that. You need your rights at law, that it's the only thing that protects you. Um, <clears throat> it's, I do believe it's illegal and it's going to be thrown out by the court eventually. There's just too many issues with it, on class action, etc. Yeah, I should probably should address also. Um, you're forced into arbitration, it, you know, under the auspices of the registry, <coughs> but hidden within the language, um, the principles of common law are rewritten um, on you. I think the publishers got the better of the Authors Guild in this negotiation because they've written in that equitable you know, principles of common law that are very uh, favorable to authors are not to be considered. And the literal words of what many of you probably know are very difficult contracts. They're called contracts of adhesion that publishers often lay on you. They say they force you to grant them rights. Um, there is a lot of question as to whether you know any of these publishers own any of these rights at all. I mean, for example, uh, search rights are not granted expressly in any contracts. The, the facility is to search. Publishers are actually using and authorizing this as a facet of their right to market their own editions. So they've got their editions. 
but uh, Random House explicitly exempts search rights. That's part of reserved multimedia for most people. You do not want to be forced into arb arbitration on rules that eliminate these common law equitable principles that the uh, courts have traditionally been very friendly towards authors uh, about, because many of these issues have not yet been decided at all. Uh, okay. I don't think there is, I just want to return to the orphan issue. I really, there is no issue with orphans. It's just, um, this, that it too is a, is a gambit to shift costs and burdens off onto owners um, from the online publishers. It's incredible to me because online publishing is so cheap, it bears absolutely no relationship to the economics of, uh, of print. Um, a deal has been conducted here. To me, there's, I, I don't see that there's been any professional financial evaluation of the assets being conveyed. There are many assets being conveyed within this structure of this document. There, uh, there's, a, there's a liability cap on security breaches for Google. There's also a collectivization of, of claims for hacking and dis destruction of, the, of, this, of your material. Say, you know, some hacker hacks in and, and uh, you know, it, it's effectively, the value is effectively destroyed by its being available for free online somewhere. Um, the structure of that exonerates uh, Google uh, from all liability over 40 to 50 million dollars per act. That's just a casting of the liability upon uh, authors, and there could very easily be total hacking. I mean, you know, Google's just been attacked by, you know, Chinese hackers. Uh, it's it's a very uh, live thing. Without this agreement, you have no such uh, provision governing all of this, and that that is a much better situation because the damages, the, the actual damages, however huge they may be, of your individual claim are still there. They are not governed by this rigid contract. Um, the whole thing is an exercise in cost shifting and burden shifting that is uh, inappropriate and incorrect. I, I really, I, I think it's very important for people to opt out of this thing. Um, it's too bad that, you know, it's too hard with, the, you know, such a diver, uh, dispersed class of authors to do anything like that typically happens in class actions such as a, an opt-out drive you know, to cause the parties to just drop this case. But I think that people are much better off without this agreement. I don't, you know, I'm, I doubt that it's illegal, I mean, that it's legal or that it'll, you know, uh, that it'll, it'll uh, the survive appeal in the end, but I don't think that's any reason to be um, apathetic and just to drift in to this. I think it's been very abusive, this, the use of this entire opt-out process to try to get you to sign to the terms of a 300-plus page agreement that nobody can possibly know what, what it contains. Um, just, uh, and just the terms themselves are on their face wrong. You already have 80 to 90 percent of net, if it's going to be on a net basis, uh, being offered by a lot of uh, other online publishers who are just beginning their little, you know, excursion in online publishing. So to be locked into something like this is, uh, uh, <coughs> it's not a good idea. So, <laughs> I'd be happy to take questions. Anybody has any particular questions? Yeah, well, we're going to have a, uh, does anybody want to speak uh, shortly? To oh, I think so. First, in response to, uh, uh, to James, um, uh, the rules are actually quite clear and spelled out as to what gets displayed and what doesn't and, and how the splits work. A lot of the settlement in, uh, structure is, is to make it easy and seamless so that the, you know, the payments are clear, that you know, what, what the author gets, what the publisher gets, depending on the status of the book, to set up the means for having the easy reversion of rights so the author can get control. All that stuff is clear. And, and spelled out uh, spelled out in the settlement. And because those rules are clear, like if you if you decide to be to participate and to take take part in these new markets, and these are new markets that would be created, um, you'll know what the deal is. 
and you don't have to submit the contract. That, I mean, if, I'm really surprised to hear this repeated. Um, you don't, the Book Rights Registry is not going to be re reviewing millions and millions of contracts. It won't. The whole thing is set up not to do that because it would be impossible to do that. Um, the rights clearance mess we would have if we didn't set up the rules would, would swamp, uh, the expenses would swamp any possible benefit. And that's why this sort of market for that's outprint Google's books, but excuse me, I don't have the floor right now. Um, uh, and that's why this sort of market hasn't been set up before, because it takes the transaction costs of going author to author, contract to contract. These contracts are, are, are deep in warehouses or in the, or, or in the, uh, you know, the, the, the literary estates uh, file drawers. Nobody knows what's in a lot of these contracts. You need an efficient way to, um, to, to administer it and to have some way to set up this new market. And it's a whole new market. And that's what this settlement allows you to do. Take part in this new market for out-of-print books. You heard, the, you heard what it is. It, it allows you to take part. Or you can say, look, I don't like it. Or I tried it out. I don't like it. Shut everything down and then and do whatever you want. Um, you are free to participate in any new things that people come up. You may have heard about Amazon's new deal for self-published stuff. That might be good. You can do that if you want. You can do anything you want. The rights are yours. You do not give up your copyright to Google. You do not give up your trademark to Google. That's just wrong. Um, let's see. Uh, on some of the other issues that came up. Uh, privacy. Privacy is an important matter to authors. It's important to us. Look, we've... We, we have Roy Blunt as our president. He was on the non-disclosure agreement. Judy Bloom's our vice president. She's passionately concerned about censorship and privacy uh, rights. Uh, uh, we, uh, we looked at this closely, and the, the issues of privacy, are much, of privacy are much, much bigger than what happens in this settlement. Uh, so for example, and, and many of them are dealt with. For example, the public library terminals. There's no way, no how, any public library is going to allow Google to see what the user log is on their library terminals. People going to library terminals have the library's protection uh, as far as privacy is concerned. They can look at whatever they want, and, and no one will be any the wiser unless the library starts turning over the records. Libraries don't do that. Colleges and universities, um, you know, good libraries don't do that. I mean, there could be libraries that would. Um, Colleges and universities have data agreements already with databases. They don't turn over the user lists to the, to the data providers. That's not in standard commercial contracts. It won't be in any contract that Google enters into with the institutions. Um, as far as people buying uh, the right to view things online, yes, Google will know who bought the right to view a book online. But that's what happens online. You know, Amazon knows what what Kindle books are bought. They know every single book that's bought for a Kindle. They know if you're reading it. They have a thing called WhisperSync. So if you're reading your Kindle at night, they know what page you're on so that the next day when you turn on your iPhone, it'll sync up to what, what you were reading last night. It, it's all there in the cloud. There are huge privacy issues with online activity and with online reading. Those have to be dealt with. But to say, you know, let's not do the settlement because this has the same problem that you know, Amazon's Kindle has, it is not a good reason not to do this settlement. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, copyright policy issue. OK, sure. Uh, getting Congress involved sounds like a great idea. We had an active litigation to deal with. We had a litigation right now we had to resolve. It wasn't something where we could say, look, we've got a real issue here. Let's go to Congress and see if they can work it out for us. We had something to resolve right now. So what are our options? Our options are to litigate it through to the very end. Okay, so that's one thing you could do. And you could say, uh, you know, if you're the author's going to say, we think we'll win this case. But guess what? James says it was fair use. And you could fill a room much bigger than this size with copyright professors who would say it was fair use. We could lose that case. And then what happens if we lose the case? Does it mean that Google gets the right to scan and display snippets? Yep. What else does it mean? It means Yahoo can. It means Microsoft can. They can all scan and display snippets. It means WebMD can scan What's wrong a, a with that? excuse me. Let me finish. It means WebMD can scan a medical library and display snippets. Could you talk more than anybody? Regular up there? order, please. We'll, they, other Could people will get a turn. We'll when? make sure. When? <laughs> I'm the I'm the one proponent of the settlement up here. I, I should have enough time to talk. Um, 
they could they could all start scanning and displaying snippets. Science fiction fans could could scan books and display snippets. And who controls the scans? What security do you have uh, of the scans are, are now legal? These fair use scans are being made. That's and what all happens? Competition among publishers. It's a good thing for authors. It's not publishers I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, people who want to uh, make snippets of Harry Potter available through their basement servers. I'm talking about college students. I'm talking about anybody who has a website who wants to attract people to it could display snippets if Google wins the case. And it would allow all sorts of scanning with no control over those, over those digital volumes that are created. That's, it, it, it could be a in our view, a catastrophic loss. You, and now maybe people here are fine with that. Maybe people here are fine with everyone scanning and holding on servers with no security and making snippets available, but we weren't fine with that. And what happens if we win? Okay, that's the other possibility. You push it through the end and you win. Um, then we'll have demonstrated that Google commercial enterprise cannot do scanning and show snippets like that. And that would be a good thing. But you know what? The music industry went through this and they kept winning lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit and they got nowhere. If we want to go down the way of the RIAA, we can do that. But it's much smarter, much, much smarter to create markets and to satisfy the need rather than to just fight it because it's going to be with us either way. Thank you, Paul. Can you stop there and we'll put it? Okay. Uh, from James? Um, I would just uh, say that the choice facing the people who negotiated the settlement was not between negotiating this settlement and nothing. There were lots of other things on the table, and those could have included uh, either a settlement that did contain more robust privacy protections, such that in the settlement itself, it committed to not asking the libraries and the subscribers to supply that information. And similarly, the choice when the lawsuit was on the table could have been to negotiate a compromise of those claims uh, and leave the point of liability up, up without doing this very extensive future scanning program. Paul explained that they proposed this future deal and that the settlement is essentially this large deal to set up a new program for selling books. That's exciting. It opens new possibilities, but it wasn't required by the lawsuit and it strikes me at least as questionable use of the settlement procedure. Well, I would just want to comment that I think that clarity in the meaning of fair use under the law would probably be a very good thing for everyone. Um, I, I really think that if you're going to sue Google for uh, and they're going to defend on fair use, you should pursue that claim and go ahead and get that clarity of the law rather than moving to try to make a you know, to appoint yourself literary agent for the entire world and cut yourself on a permanent commission. That is not appropriate. There is no agency authority for that. There is no consent from any owners for that. They do not necessarily consent to a fire sale of their property at this moment in time on a deal that is completely unfair that, that uh, allows Google to you make any use within Google products and services subject only to talking to this registry, eliminating every right of every individual owner to do those deals themselves. Uh, the audit is feckless in there. Google is the one who has uh, uh, the right to audit and obtain all information that the registry has within this agreement. The registry's audit is and completely subsumed in trade secret confidentiality. Uh, all data goes only one way, out of owners to Google. Uh, the deal itself is obviously off the cuff. There was no financial evaluation of, of this asset, the value of the asset. Uh, no uh, good, from what I can see, there's huge um, uh, valuable uh, uh, costs being shifted to the owners and if you're going to agree to something in agreement that shifts costs and burdens to you you want you want you need the cash for that you need to know what the value of that is and you need to be compensated for it the only thing that is being compensated for here in a typical entertainment industry scam 
is a big, broad, vague grant of all rights whatsoever, subject to a very limited, tiny, uh, uh, and contingent agreement to pay on very limited display rights. Everything else is granted to Google. So that's just uh, A number one incompetence as, as an uh, entertainment industry matter in, this, in the deal, so-called. So I don't, just on so many levels, this thing is illegal, uh, just um, improper. It tramples everybody's discretion over their own business affairs, their ability to wait to sell their digital rights, which may be the most valuable portion of, of their rights ever it, to come into existence when they choose, when a fully fleshed developed market exists for it among many online publishers, and to wait and see what they want to do with their, their works. The complexity of this also uh, is going to damage and destroy um, any future copyright. It seeks to amend, everybody, <coughs> amend everybody's co uh, contracts on them. It says that, oh well, you know, 50-50, you know, the registry is going to be, it, it, without reference to who was actually granted those rights. This is a very difficult subject in many of these contracts. There could be f further litigation in the future in which, you know, uh, the SDNY could say, hey, you know, this, these are contracts of adhesion. Nobody, there was no specificity about any grant of any of these electronic rights to the publisher. Nobody knew what they were doing when they said, oh, 12% uh, of net. And what does net mean? Uh, it's very, it could, could very well be that a court would throw these things out globally in the future, and, there, and uh, therefore this settlement uh, immediately cuts in author, uh, uh, publishers to proceeds that really should 100% be going to the authors. So, I, yeah. All right, what we'd like to do now is... I'm, I'm doing with a question. Okay. No, uh, we have another order. The publisher because I'm, I'm a publisher and I signed on, I didn't sign on, it was sent to me from Google a couple of, about a year or so ago, our partnership. And this partnership, the way it unfolds is that each week I get this uh, weekly report about the click-throughs and the buys and all the drafts and whatnot. And what I noticed, if I kept putting snippets, snippets, I'm thinking, what snippets? They're putting the entire book online. People are emailing me and said, I've read your book. I think it's great. I said, would you buy that? I can buy it. I read it on Google. Right. You know what I mean? Well, I'm getting it As a publisher, I paid for that book. You know, it's like Ronald Reagan. I paid for that by Mr. Bush. You know what I mean? That's my book. I had to pay for the editing costs. Exactly. I had to pay the authors. Where's my money? <laughs> and not that, well, where's your why didn't someone special? ask me permission to do this? Why am I in a partnership that I didn't ask for? And how can I get out of it? Uh, okay, wait, there should be some clarification here. Can we just, okay, why don't we try and move the, okay, let's get the sponsoring organizations to get a word in. So, uh, Sally, uh, you want to uh, speak for, for ASJ? For just a moment, thank you. I'm Sally Shannon. I'm the president of the American Society of Journalists and Authors. And I just want to point out that the fact that we are all together in this room is uh, a wonderful act of cooperation. Many times in the past, all our organizations, the, the National Writers Union, ASJA, and the Authors Guild have worked together on projects. And I sincerely hope we will do that again that there will be a time when we're all on the same side of the table. I should also mention that our taping today is done by the Internet Society, also a sponsor of this event, and we, we thank them for that. Um, I have a, a couple of questions that, that came up as I was listening. Um, I would like to uh, observe that one thing that I have thought about all through, and that is that uh, we can talk a lot about the reversion of rights and the clock running and so forth, but in reality, Paul, don't you think that we have a new default here and that no publisher will ever allow rights to revert to the author again? Yeah, well, in the settlement, we uh, specifically provided that availability through the settlement does not make a book imprint. It can count if you have a contract that has thresholds that says that uh, you know, there has to be you know, $500 or $1,000 in, in royalties per year. Uh, 
uses through the settlement can come toward that, but no more than 50%. And if that bothers anyone, you have the re remedy of always turning off all uses so that there are no, re no revenues through the, uh, through the settlement and just normal you know, commercial uses would determine it. So no, I, I don't think that, I think that we have that issue in publishing generally. Uh, I don't think the settlement contributes one way or another toward it. Uh, Lynn, you're a book agent, uh, and I have heard from time to time that agents uh, get an amount of money from, uh, or would get an amount of money from the Book Rights Registry for turning over author's contracts. Uh, is that something you have heard anything about or read? I haven't heard that. The, the money that people are uh, going to be getting will be aggregations of the cash payments that are going to be made. That, by the way, is um, it's very open to fraud. Anybody can claim. Cash payments are going to be doled out. There will be no checking uh, who, who it's being doled out to. Um, and so any agent or publisher who's published, um, you know, we've done maybe a thousand books. You know, I mean, if you have hundreds of thousands of books, uh, $60 a book is going to add up to something, so it effectively to me is a bribe to all agents to just, uh, you know, herd into this sheep like, you know, without, peep, without a peep. And wait, wait a minute. There's, there's, there's no turning over of authors' contracts for money. Where, where the, did that come the from? The registry is, um, is going to be determining who, whose ownership. Uh, who, uh, who ha is the rights holder of a particular title. So therefore, it, right. it has the right to determine and to uh, require information of, to determine that ownership, whether the author or the publisher controls those rights. Right, but it's no turning over of contracts. How the hell is it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 there's a dispute, folks. No, no, no. 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 time, there will be disputes, absolutely. But it's not going to be the general rule. I mean, you know, for one thing, it's... Uh, there will be many, many disputes on all of these old contracts because there really was no meeting of the minds on um, many, many electronic rights. Uh, there, there are very important legal issues there that you cannot force into arbitration. So this means all of pre-2009 literature is being forced into, into arbitration and uh, federal, they're being barred from access to federal courts. Absolutely not, any of these. I don't know where you're getting that. And I don't know where you get most of the stuff you, you talk about. You read your contract. You did not. Or if you did, you're, you're, you're adding things out of your vivid imagination. Oh, this stuff, I, I don't know. For real. I mean, there's, there's lots of literary agents. I think it's possible. There's only one Lin Chu. Um, I think it's possible that you're not. Uh, really it, could, it, could be, it could be, it could be, if I could just interject, I mean, I did, I read the author publisher procedures on the way up on the train, and, and that wasn't the first time I've read it, but I read it again, and it does seem to be that there's, there's a specific clause in it that says that part of the function of the BRR is to, is to collect uh, contracts and, and uh, uh, determine, uh, determine to pay. in order to determine right. how these yes. rights are to be uh, okay. apportioned. Okay, so here's, Here's how it happens in the in the real world. Author claims the book, publisher claims the book. It's a you know it's it's, it's Harper Collins, and uh, and they they both claim the book. If we know the standard trade contracts that have been been in place, if it's out of print and it's after 1987, there's not much dispute. It's a 50-50 split. Unless but they don't admit that any book is out of print. Forget that. All books are in print in their mind. No. So talk about the in print books. Okay. okay. That's the but, tendency. But that, that's, sure. That's that's the tendency. But uh, and you want to dispute it, you have to go to arbitration. Well, no. This third party settlement does not have the right to amend everybody's book contracts to say we are now going to split the revenues from Google 50-50. It's, yeah, it, and it doesn't. It doesn't amend book contracts. It says for these particular uses, limited uses, not like you said before where they can do whatever they want, for these limited uses, this is how the split works. That's and an it, amendment of the contract. It's, 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 okay. it's a, it's a you, rule. If the of author it. is entitled to 100% this then turn contract off the uses. cannot. No, this. Well, the, it does the admit that that the uh, that the author and not the publisher owns and controls that book and can absolutely can absolutely controls absolutely. If and that can be arbitration. No, 
You, I, I can't believe that this fundamental thing what? you somehow yeah. missed, and, yes. and someone from the right. National Writers Union, when your position missed this, anyone you can, can turn it off. Anyone can turn it off and it turn off anyone who recognized as a rights holder. First, you have to get recognized as a rights holder. Of course, you're an author. Your name's on the book. Okay, let's let's calm down. I understand what's going on. There is a settlement agreement. Let's read the paragraph right now. Look. The, right, yeah. the rights holder is easy to identify for most books. You're on, you, you know, your name is there. You're in the, there's copyright office records. There's all sorts of records that says who you are and, and your... And your uh, Let's take a so concrete like, example. All right, what, what really most people are going to want to do is the author is going to want to sign up with Google. Okay? Then there becomes an issue as to whether, whether the author, then the, the BRR, will be contacting the publisher to be sure that, oh, do you actually control these rights? That allows the publisher. That's not true, right? That's true. That allows the publisher to step in and, uh, and dispute that. I mean, this is what the BRR is set up to do. No, it's not. The, the, the publisher comes in and claims publisher rights and says, I'm the publisher of this book. The author comes in and claims author rights and says, I'm the author of the book. It's an out-of-print book, and it, the, re the reason we'll know it's out-of-print is because Google is checking to find out what's out-of-print. It's in Google's interest uh, to find things to be out-of-print because then they'll be in the program. So you have you know, you know, big old scary Google out there determining the thing on your side, trying to say that things are out-of-print. Then the rules apply. The rules say the defaults for an out-of-print book are that it would, would display unless the author or the publisher says no. And you have the right, absolute right, as the author, to say no to the, any display. Only if you're found to be a rights holder. I'm not so you must not merely be the author, but have exclusive rights. If you example, if you license non-exclusive rights, you're no longer a rights holder for purposes of the settlement. Right. Because That's your not rights true. are not. It, the word That's exclusive true. rights holder appears in the definition of rights holder. No. Not any author. Only one holds exclusive rights. That's that's not true. If you if you are if you have licensed. <laughs> Exclusive rights, as you do to have an imprint book. But if you license non-exclusive rights, yeah. you're still the rights holder. If you're, you're not the exclusive rights holder anymore, because you've licensed non-exclusive rights. No, this is you're, you're just wrong. You, no, yes. you're both wrong. <laughs> if, right. if you're the rights holder, if you're the author, you have you have the copyright. You may license exclusive rights, or maybe you have it. Or you may license non-exclusive rights. You still have rights under the settlement to turn off the book. I'm sorry. I, that is the way it is, and I'm. I'm frankly Sam shocked that you don't understand that. Turning on the book, uh, to turn on the book, an author will want to show that to basically say, I, "I own these rights, and I disclaim whatever that old contract says." So the BRR is there to essentially say, "Oh, well, you know, we're going to determine whether, in fact, you you control these rights because we have a, another claiming publisher here who says they control the rights." This for an book. Because you're talking no, about turning on the books. Print books. Well, then you're not talking about turning on the rights. The rights are on. It's about turning them off. Uh, but we're uh, talking about whether the author is getting 100% of the proceeds. Because BRR says, oh no, we have our own rules and we're going to st start splitting this whenever there's a dispute. But then the No, that's not true. If there's a dispute, the money is held until the dispute is resolved. Okay. All right, we're going to let science fiction writers. Yeah, I get to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael Capobiaco. I'm a past president of science fiction and fantasy writers of America. First, I'd like to thank everybody. I mean, everybody is very clear about their position and uh, ex is expressing it very forcefully. Uh, CIFLA was uh, founded in 1965 by Damon Knight. We have about 1,500 members, most of whom are published authors. Uh, we did file an objection to the to the original settlement. We're in the process of filing a, an objection to uh, the re revised settlement, which uh, hopefully we will get done in a few days because it's got to get in. Um, the main problem we see with this, and, and it's something that people have touched on, but not you know not emphasized as much as we would like, is the uh, the opt out nature of of the program. Basically, what uh, what the settlement says is if you don't show up, if you don't, if you don't come forward and tell us what to do with your rights, we're going to uh, default to certain, uh, uh, to certain defaults, uh, among which is that this book will be displayed and, and money will be collected. Uh, 
if you don't, uh, it is true that ultimately down the road there is a process of dealing with some of the money that they claim under this, uh, but uh, we still don't like the fact that if you don't show up, you don't get a say in how things are, uh, are, uh, are adjudicated or, or uh, paid out. Um, there are other details we don't like. For example, I mean, I, I may be more extreme than Lynn on this. I, I don't think publishers get, should get any money from out-of-print books because, out of, at least in my neck of the publishing world, if a book is out of print, it should be reverted. The, the publisher contract says, you know, revert it and we'll give it back to you. So in, in most cases, if a book hasn't been reverted, it's because the author has neglected to do so, or the publisher is uh, stonewalling, which happens a lot. So, but, but my sense of this is, in most cases, at least with, with genre fiction, if a book is out of print, publishers out of the picture, should be for, you know, it's the author's stuff. And then there's stuff within the settlement that does somewhat address this, but not to my satisfaction. Um, but getting back to the opt-out thing, I mean, my sense is that there was not enough notice to authors. I mean, it's very difficult. There are millions and millions of authors that are affected by this. It would be very difficult to actually notify them all. But according to my understanding of class action, really, you're supposed to notify them, and you're supposed to make a really, really strong effort to notify them. And my sense is that, that not that strong a, 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 an effort was made. I mean, for example, within CIFA, uh, we received emails from, from, from Authors Guild saying, please send out this email to all your members. And we did that. But still, it's an email notice. And, you know, people tend to lose emails. People tend to uh, think emails are spam, even from us. Uh, so, you know, I mean, my sense is that many authors, not, uh, many authors haven't even really heard about this yet. And among the ones who have, they're extremely confused. They don't know what to do. They're, you know, and one of the reasons we decided to have this is because authors generally are, are not business people, unfortunately. And they, they, they really, if they look at this settlement and they, their heads start spinning, even before they read the fourth word. Um, so, I mean, we're concerned that, that uh, a lot of them will just not do anything. And if they not do, and as Lynn said, not doing anything is the worst thing you could possibly do with this. Um, I mean, the whole idea of orphan works, and, and Lynn also spoke to this. I mean, I, I have a different view on orphan works. People tend to be conflating orphan works with out of print works. And you know, I, hear, I hear this all the time. It's like if a work is out of print, it no longer has any values. It's basically has, it can't be marketed. It's dead. Nobody's interested in it. But the author is still interested in it. The author wants to sell that book again, in many cases. And uh, it's not an orphan work if they don't know about this uh, settlement. It's someone who hasn't been contacted yet. Um, I think one of the things, if, if the settlement is passed or approved, there has to be a, a, a massive effort to find the authors who have not heard about this, don't understand it, and get them on board to either, I, I would love to have them have another opportunity to opt out, just because I don't think they've had that opportunity yet. Um, and that's, that's my question for you, Paul. Um, what will the book rights registry do to find the authors? I know there's some provision where some of the unclaimed funds will be devoted to defining authors after a certain amount of time, but why wait? I mean, why not start the process now? I mean, it, it seems like starting the process as part of notifying authors would have been a good, good thing to do. Yeah, well, the process is started now through the whole claims process and the notification process, um, which um, Actually, it's been quite extensive and and uh, and expensive, and lots and lots of people do know about uh, the settlement. I'm sure I'm sure some don't. Um, but on the um, on the opt out provision, which I, I think I think there are two things that get people uh, who understand the settlement uh, concerned about it. That is opt out, and that is Google. And there's this general fear like Google is getting gaining power is too big, all such. Um, and the other is the opt out nature. But without the opt out part of the settlement, we wouldn't have had a settlement. 
We wouldn't have had a new market. You couldn't create this market in a, on an opt-in basis, one book at a time. You'd never get anyone to subscribe to it. So the opt-out is absolutely essential to creating this new market. And you guys should want the new market. It's a way to make money. Um, how much money we have, uh, we, we don't know. But we know that photocopy systems overseas generally do opt-out. That's the European way of dealing with photocopy licensing, opt-out systems. And they work. They work much better than our system. They generate a lot more revenue. Uh, in, the, in the UK, for example, last year, $36 million was paid out to rights holders for photocopy uses. Um, uh, there, you know, it's, uh, it's more limited use than are allowed in the settlement in some ways, though it's then, of course, it's in print and out of print. But with that as a benchmark, and with the UK at about one-sixth the size of ours, we can imagine that this should generate tens of millions of dollars for authors that wouldn't be there otherwise. So, the, you know, the reason we're doing it, the reason we think it's important, and the reason it's opt out is because with the settlement, there's tens of millions of dollars available to authors that otherwise wouldn't be there. You have the absolute right to turn off all uses at any time and take advantage of, of standard commercial markets and whatever develops in the future. But it's really important, we think, to have more and more markets. Copyright is about creating markets for authors. This is a new and could be very significant uh, market for some authors. As far as finding rights holders, uh, uh, it's going on right now through the notice process, through people coming forward and making claims, um, and it that, will that's, be... That's, that's not active, that's passive. No, it's active. You, there are, there's notice going out, and there's, and there's ads that have been bought, and, and emails going out, notifying people and having a... But we don't have the staff right now. I mean, until the settlement goes through, the Book Rights Registry won't have the money to go out and find rights holders. May I ask why you're, how you are planning the Book Rights Registry right now? prior to its approval, and what your organization's uh, connection is with this uh, operation? It, it will be, we, first I, I should make clear, we have no financial stake whatsoever in well, any of this. Well, you seem to have uh, selected its executive director in the interim uh, already. It's the, the, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. the executive director designate, uh, but it, uh, that's, that's not official and, and, you know, until the book rights registry. That's totally improper. Uh, if this uh, is a, uh, uh, according to you. Um, oh, 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 um, well, you, you didn't really, uh, I mean, will any funds, be, as soon as funds are available, will they be devoted to beating the bushes for, for the authors who haven't, right. haven't shown and, up? And, and, the, and the way this works is, um, and we've, we have, as you know, the, the authors registry, that, which has been operating for years, and it's now paid $10 million to authors, mostly from photocopy uses in the UK. Um, you get the money, you find out who the authors are that it's due to, and then you, and then you find them. And, and you can find uh, out-of-print authors with a high success rate. You but find Paul, but the authors' percent. registry really has been very diligent, uh, negligent, really, I think. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of updating people's contact information, it hasn't been done for, with CIFLA members since 1997. As soon as we have, if we have, when we have, when we have, uh, uh, money for an author, if it's a CIFWA member and the contact information is out of date, we'll get in touch with CIFWA. We don't do it as, we're trying to keep the administrative costs low. We don't just, you know, well, go I'm off. I understand, the original, I mean, this is getting off, off topic. Um, but, but we are finding people. I mean, we, uh, at, uh, at the rate of 85% of uh, out of print book authors. The ALCS in London does even better because they're bigger and have more money, and they're, they're reaching a uh, uh, more than 90% of our print book authors. Well, just, I, well, it's my opinion that we need to have a, we, the book rights registry would need to have a more a, more active than what you're saying before I would be happy with it. More active search mechanism, and not just uh, expect authors to show up for their pittance. No, it's it's, it's, it's not that at all. So. Yes, I just want to say one thing, and that is that ASJA central objection has been always uh, the issue of the opt out. Um, and you very often mention ASCAP as an analogy. Now we know ASCAP, all of us have heard of it, but ASCAP from the get-go has been an opt-in. To this day, 
something like about half of all musicians belong, and they decide themselves whether they want to join up with ASCAP. And also, ASCAP has twice been sued for antitrust and exists today under the supervision of the court. So the, the analogy with ASCAP strikes me um, in many regards as, as inept. And I still, I still have an issue. <laughs> I still, I still have um, the, the central issue that trouble, continues to trouble me is why can't you just trust authors to opt in if this is really such a good deal? Mm -hmm. Because the market would never get going. If the free market could generate this uh, on its own by people opting in one at a time, it would have happened already. Uh, it, it, it won't. You won't get the critical mass to get something that people want to subscribe to. Um, isn't it because Google wouldn't agree to it on those terms? No, I, the benefit to authors is greater with an opt-out system because you'll actually get a market open and functioning. That is no. the question. Oh, Google, yes, you're right. Google wouldn't agree to it, and we didn't see enough benefit in it with, a, um, with an opt-in system. All right, the last panelist that hasn't been heard from yet. Why do we only have 10 days to opt out in? Why can't we opt out at any time we like our copyright? You can at any time choose to turn off everything. I have a question before you run out. Uh, and whenever. Paul, Paul has to leave, and I think we need to be fair both in allowing him to leave and expressing <laughs> our profound gratitude, and mine personally, that you showed up and braved the lions, and I think we've all benefited greatly from your contribution. But I think it's only so fair to let him leave and not think yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm not Do you want to show Mike and throw Michael to the line? I got this one question that I need to ask about the book registry. Yes, please, sir. You said earlier that half of the composition of the book registry board right. would be authors. Right. And the other half would be published. Right. Okay, now, who or what organization is determining which authors and which publishers? The AAP and the AG, or all of us in one form or another? So uh, we anticipate that the Authors Guild will appoint the initial board of the Book Rights Registry to get it up and running, and then we plan to be from members Done of the Authors Guild only, or at some No, level? it is. Our interests are not for the Authors Guild only. This You're is for. Yeah. I'm just no. Where are you going to pull them from? I, I don't know, but but that that's the way, and it would have to be court approved. The the whole the, the board will have to be court approved. There's not a narrow Authors Guild interest, whatever you think that is, that is to be served here. There's an interest of all authors. Well, I'm available. Pulling the bodies from. Good question. It's not served that way. Exactly. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Well, I was asking a question, and I did not appreciate that you dismissed that way. Where would you be pulling these members from? Where, what body I, of, of people would you be? Well, what, so what I mean, uh, the, you know, we have to devise a process that's, so that's fair to authors generally. I, no, look, if if you want, yes, <clears throat> let me let me respond. Uh, if it's there, you know, one way to set it up would be as a membership organization. If you do that, you have enormous costs associated with that. So you have to find some other way to be fair and representative of, of the rights of, of everyone. We have no financial stake in this. We have no interest in the long run being involved. We just want it to be out there walking on its own. OK, well, sorry I wasn't able to answer your question. Edwards. Do you have how many questions are you going to Did you not answer the question? I didn't get the answer either. He okay. didn't okay. both of them. He said initially the authors killed. And my problem, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that I'm trying to throw no dissuasion in there. But it appears to me that the authors guild is trying to throw a lot of dissuasion in there. But it appears to me that the authors guild is uh, uh, appears to be arguing this case more in favor of Google than in favor of the authors. Right. Yeah. And that's a problem that I have with this discussion. I don't, I don't agree with that, obviously. Uh, so let, me, let me try and get this off of the Authors Guild and back to the question of this settlement and the choices that we face as writers and that concern the other organizations here on the, on the podium, the, the writers' groups. And I'll say, restraining somewhat my, my, my instincts to respond to everything you said. I will say, if you want sort of a broader picture of, of our position as the NWU on the broader questions, we do have a lot of background information 
on the NWU Book Division website, nwubook.org, including our FAQ with more details, uh, information for those of you who have friends on the West Coast about a similar event that's going to take place in Berkeley on Friday, and a petition that one of our esteemed members, Ursula Le Guin, a member both of, of NWU and of sci-fi writers, uh, has on her own uh, initiated and is soliciting signatures not limited to people who are members of any of these groups, but a general petition by individual authors to the court. But the National Writers Union helped organize this event because we think that this proposal is a bad deal for working writers. Let me explain why. First, the money is grossly inadequate. Writers should realize that as compensation for past infringement, we've heard the figure $60 a book, but that's the total per book for all the rights holders. For books in print, the entire amount will be paid to your publisher, and it will be up to your publisher to decide how much, if any, of that they think they're supposed to pass on to you, unless you take them to arbitration. Authors may get only a fraction of the $60, most of which is likely to go to the print publishers, Author shares will be determined only later after it's too late to opt out. There's no guarantee of how much you write get for future use of your work either, but better deals than the settlement are already available. If you own the rights, you can submit your book directly to Google through its own partner program and get a larger share of the revenue from Google for the same uses by Google than if you remain in the settlement. Or you can have Amazon offer a Kindle edition, or you can sell PDFs on your own website and keep 100% of the revenue. The second fundamental unfairness is the opt-out process, in which authors who do nothing not only will get no money, but will irrevocably forfeit some rights and control over their work. Worse, anyone who does nothing will be bound by whatever the settlement is determined after the fact to mean. We can argue, you've heard us, about what this settlement means, but the honest answer is that we don't know and none of the people on this stage are the ones who are going to decide. Inherent in remaining in the settlement is gambling on how the settlement will be interpreted and allowing your future rights to your own work to be determined by people and procedures that have not yet been decided. Third, writers need to know that the proposed settlement would affect not just your relationship with Google, but your existing relationships with print publishers overriding some of their terms and subjecting them to interpretation and binding arbitration by players to be named later, the book rights registry and the arbitrators. And this will happen, obviously, in the context, ongoing, across-the-board rights grab by those same publishers who are making sweeping, bogus claims to exclusive ownership of ebook rights and to owing only royalty percentages on ebook sales, even when authors never signed over ebook rights, or when ebooks are covered by a sub rights clause with a much higher revenue share for authors. So the question I have, which I would have asked of Mr. Aiken, but I think we've kind of gotten his answer. He thinks the arbitrators will somehow always decide in the, in the author's favor or be fair, or somehow the registry will always decide in the author's favor, or somehow the publishers will just, of their own generosity, decide to be fair when they get the money and get told, well, give as much of it as you think is right to, uh, to, the, to the author and keep the rest. You know, but I, I'd like to pose that as the, the most neutral expert in the room. Professor Gremelman, um, looking at this and trying to project forward, if the settlement is approved, assuming that print publishers keep making the same claims to ebook rights under the settlement that they're making in every other dispute with writers, is there any structural guarantee that authors will get a fair share of their per book payouts rather than having most of it go to print publishers? And how would you realistically foresee if the settlement is <coughs> approved? that those $60 payouts will end up getting divided between authors and publishers. Putting you on the spot. I don't know enough about book industry contracts and practices to venture any particularly informed guess as to what will happen to that money. Uh, I suspect that actually a lot of it will be consumed up in the fees for arbitrations to decide some of these things. <laughs> uh, and beyond that, it's actually very hard for me to predict that. Uh, there's enough complexity in terms of how the rights are defined in the settlement, and enough ambiguity, that I expect some of it to go easily, and a lot of, especially the higher value uh, 
you know, publishers with a lot at stake to push on particular terms they think would be advantageous to them and try to establish <coughs> precedent because we're in arbitration, but a set of expectations about how this will work out. Uh, and this is a situation in which the publishers are much more concentrated than authors, and therefore they have a structural advantage. We must remember that the Justice Department attorneys, when they spoke uh, on the first settlement, said flatly, the publishers will be in control of the Books Rights Registry. They just made that flat statement that the power rests with the publishers. Based on what? Based on the way the Books Right Registry is set up and, and yeah. the way the terms of the deals are structured. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Is it time for Q&A? Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I want to ask a very practical question. You know, the thing that bothers me the most about the settlement is the way it gives Google a kind of monopoly so that even if somebody else wanted to put your book online, nobody would go searching there because everybody would go to Google Book Search. Yeah. And this is, what, this is what bothers me. And the thing that's so hard is that we have to make this opt-in decision before the judge reviews the settlement, which I would have loved to ask him the reason for. But I have four books in print and two books not in print. And those two books are the dear ones to my heart. They're still being read by scholars and quoted. And I want them to be available. And what I'm afraid of is that if I opt out, those books are not going to be in Google Book Search and no one will find them. You know, I still get people um, contacting me based on those books, but if they disappear, um, they'll sort of die. And for me, it would be worth being in, at least for those two books. You can include your own book under Google's partner program, so that it will be found in Google search right alongside the things that they've stolen know, and scanned. But, but from what I understand about the Google partners, the terms aren't quite the same, and I haven't been able to scrutinize them enough to really know the difference. But there are people who have, who have said that Google partners is not really equivalent. And the question is, would it be in the same database? It'll be in the same database. I don't know if you so want to. So if anybody can advise me about either of these things, I would appreciate it. Well, if you opt out, they, that is their threat, that they're going to eliminate you from that database. However, yes, you can always sign up with Google on whatever terms you can get out. Assuming they let the artist program stand. Or, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. It, it totally is there. It absolutely is there. Um, but there are also many places online where you can um, put your books. Of course. Yeah, I mean, or, I can put you know, them on my website, but I'm not going to come up the same way in searches as if I were in Google. Yes. No, you would, actually, if, if, it were, if it were up there. I mean, you know, anyone can put anything online, and every search engine will find it. All right, we have a number of questions. One, yeah. two, three. Yeah. These three. I just want to think of that, too, because he was talking as if there's no online market. And I just want to point out that a whole bunch of us since 2000 in the science fiction field yeah. have had stuff on FictionWise. And when they first started, I received from FictionWise for each of 10 stories the same royalty advance I would have received from an anthology for those stories and a 30% royalty. And FictionWise has been willing to put almost anything that's been in print mm -hmm. on those terms. Now, right now, they've been sold to Barnes and Noble and things. Are, I'm not sure what's going right, on. Right, everybody's there. gaming this situation. Yeah, but there are I, other places like yeah. Lulu. E, my ebook right. is supposedly is 90 percent. Yeah, um, right. You know, uh, Scripty. Right. The market exists and it's developing. This will stop it from developing. Right. It's just at its infancy here. But we have to be clear that Google will dominate if most of the authors do not opt out or take action. And that, to me, is where one of the serious issues here lies in that we keep being told, well, you have the freedom of choice here. You don't have to participate. I'm sorry, if 95% of all books are found through mm -hmm. the Google book search, and your book is not on the Google book search, you do have to participate if you want to sell books. And that is the conundrum. Yeah. Yes. One of the uh, things that's been nagging me ever since this came up, uh, 
member of CEQA, and we've been dealing with piracy, online piracy, for probably as long as I've been a member, which is uh, longer than I want to remember now. Um, one thing that has not been explained to me, uh, and again, I would have asked Paul if he hadn't poked out here quite so fast, <laughs> um, is what's the procedure to police usage? I mean, if you opt out, and I, I've already found stuff that I've said to Google, I don't want you to, to excerpt, excerpt it. Am I, if I opt out, is where did I opt in and say don't use this? Is the onus on me to follow up and basically treat Google like yet another pirate and take them to task and follow up after them? Because I'm a full time writer. If I'm not writing, I'm not earning money. Chasing down pirates as it is takes me half an hour every morning. Uh, if Google was saying basically, well, you can play with us or you're going to spend you know, the rest of your life trying to prove that we're not playing fair. Nobody's been able to say to me, yes, don't worry, this is taken care of. But nobody's also coming out saying flat out, yes, it's the onus is on you, it's your responsibility to make Google play there. Is there anything in place for this? Well, what, what's in place on the two sides, if, if you opt in, well, if you opt out, you have the same rights you have now. And the most effective thing you can do, which costs almost nothing, and Google will act on it, is to send them a Digital Millennium Copyright Act to take down notice. They don't have to, I mean, there's a process they can put you through, but in practice, they'll just cave. You send them a DCMA notice, Google will get rid of it. They don't want to fight those. That's their practice right now. And in all realistic probability, that's where they're going to go. So you've got a, a pretty expeditious manner. Yeah, if you remain in the settlement, you are foregoing your DCMA rights with respect to Google's use of your books, and you're back in this whatever the arbitration ends up looking like if you want to contest it, as opposed to now, you can send them a properly formulated letter, and it goes away. Either way, you have to take action. Mm -hmm. no, but if you, that was, my question was, if you, if you say, I don't want it in, which I've done, and then it shows up again, uh, through human error or something happening, is this, again, are we have to treat them like pirates or do they yes. have something in the place yes. that they will monitor themselves? You're going to have to treat them like pirates. And, and he's right. I mean, basically, if you send them a DMCA notice, they will okay because they are content aggregators. They don't care about individual pieces of content. If, if they're going to have any trouble with any piece of content, they'll get rid of it. Why not? It doesn't really matter to them. Yes. My question is, is similar, and uh, it's, I guess I'll direct it at Wen Chu. Since you're, I'm a literary agent like you are, and since you're advising your clients to opt out, mm -hmm. I, so I know you have a big client list and you have clients who have probably been in a number of anthologies, mm -hmm. excerpted in other books. Mm -hmm. I, I do a lot of that as well, which leads to thousands of excerpts mm -hmm. in lots and lots of other books, textbooks, anthologies, right. scholarly books. And I'm, I'm still down, coming down to the wire on the fence about opting in or opting out, because in a way, opting in seems like it might be an orderly way to manage keeping those things offline. And opting out feels to me like you're letting Google do whatever they want with all of those books. Because as, as you see in the partner program, there are lots of books that go up there from publishers or from wherever they come from that contain third party material. But nobody thought of that when they said, okay, this goes up in the partner program. So all this valuable material that you can relicense and relicense and relicense is going to be out there, searchable and free. Well, you get nothing for it on the Google. You get nothing for it except you get it to go in and and according to the author's bill, they're improving the process of finding these things, and they're going to be very helpful about that. Uh, you get to find those things and say, no, you can't display that insert. No, you can't display that insert. And to me, you end up having to do that on your own without this organization to help you find it. And so what, if, if I could ask you to play your own devil's advocate, what do you think are the negatives of opting out? Well, um, in terms of Google control. settlement, uh, they are required to take all of that stuff offline. Um, 
under under they if they have made out. that they have made that commitment. Yeah, that, that's not my reading. If you opt out, out. So my if reading you opt out. is if you opt out, they say they will graciously not put their put their stuff online, but they don't guarantee it's it. No, there's no, no guarantee. guarantee. It's not guarantee. Turn it off. Well, they not turn it back on again. And I, every act of uh, infringement. So you is, still, you know, uh, you still have to go into each one of those inserts. So to me, the process is the same. That you have to get involved, and and if you have to, if, if you have to point out each one of those uses of your work, no, you do not have to point out each one of those uses. What we advised people to do, and it's on the opt-out form, just put in your name. That's it. And then in the titles, they don't require you to list every. This <coughs> occurred between the original and the amended. But they no longer require you to name every single. You're leaving item. it up to them to then go do that work for you. Yeah, and you can't. If and they infringe, I have the litigators ready to sue their ass on every single <laughs> <laughs> on every single act of infringement for the max 150 statutory minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, it's important to distinguish here just a couple of ways that the books can be used. There's the situation in which somebody other than Google posts it. And Google doesn't realize it's there, it's copyrighted. That's the DMCA situation Ed was right. talking about. Right. There's the situation in which Google itself scanned it and you opt in, in which case if you tell them don't display it, right. you're under the arbitrations and the various internal provisions in the settlement. Mm -hmm. Then there is, they've scanned it and you opt out. In that situation, it's their responsibility not to display it, right. because when they do that, it's a separate act of infringement for which they can be sued. If they get it wrong, you can correct them and dump them of a, a massive act of infringement. So why will they why will they pay attention to lots of little tiny See, because they think they can win the fair use case for having scanned the books in the first place. Right. They know they can't win the fair use case for showing the whole book to the public. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to ask, uh, they keep telling you to go to the arbitrator, you can go through an arbitration. Uh, if an arbitrator makes a decision, is it legally enforceable? Yes. 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 And final. That's the difference between mediation and arbitration. Yep. Arbitration is not a court case. Right. No, no, but it's legal and not in place of court No appeals. Okay, I'd like to ask mm -hmm. if then question. Legally enforceable. Yes. 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 Okay. An if-then question. Um, what is the panel's uh, suggestion of action if the judge accepts the settlement? And what is the um, recommendation if the judge does not accept the settlement? I mean, aside from uh, punishing Google by partnering with Google Books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope. I anticipate that 99% of this is going to be tossed. There is a ground in which, you know, a revised, very, you know, eliminating all deal aspects of this, which these plaintiffs have no authority to do on behalf of anyone, uh, are dumped where there would be an exoneration, that where you would be uh, waiving and releasing certain specified acts of scanning that occurred prior to uh, January 2009. So that's what I hope will happen. If, if the judge accepts, in you, 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 other words, you're saying you, you anticipate that the judge will accept. It'll basically be thrown out, but the only the only potential settlement for these parties, I don't really, I'm not exact, I'm not a litigator, so I don't exactly know what's going to, you know, I don't understand this whole class action settlement. Like if they were to dump it, what, what would they do exactly? How would that would be phrased? But. Um, uh, I anticipate this is going to be ill. It is, and if it is approved in large, in any portion, even if it's amended, it's definitely going to get appealed. Because too many aspects of this, the entire opt-out process is, you know, violation of due process in my mind. You know, it's um, inappropriate for us. I I think that everybody should opt out. You are safer opting out. You are reserving your rights at, at, at law. The waivers and releases in this thing in Article 10 completely waive, as to Google, all rights of copyright, trademark, and droit morale. Droit morale is the you know, 
French, you know, super copyright, kind of like that the author has prior rights, you know, that, that, you know over their work. It's a, it's a concept of, of European law. But can you opt, you can't opt in later. Right. Well, that, that's the point I want to make. Like, like, you don't have to opt out. One thing that people say, you have to opt out before we know anything. You have right. to opt out before January, that's part of the January 28th. Yeah. But I think the question is, what can we do if, whether we opt out or not, what if we get stuck with a settlement that sucks? <laughs> at the, at the, and I think the answer is, <laughs> the, the answer, I think part of the answer is, what if two things are going to happen? Either the judge will accept the settlement, in which case there's a, there's a working vehicle for industry practices, or the judge will reject the settlement. In either case, what is it that we are recommended to do? How do we proceed from there? And, and that's what I'm trying to answer. In neither case will anything happen for several years of appeals. And what I would hope is that by the time this gets through at least going up to the Second Circuit, possibly the Supreme Court, that in those couple of years, those of us who have been conscientized about the significance of this issue will have gotten a rational replacement through Congress before we have to face the possibility that this might actually stand up on appeal. That is a technical question that I have. Now, none of the, uh, in order for someone to appeal, you would think it would have to be somebody who's involved in the original court case. Yes. And none of that, they're all going to be happy with it without, no matter what happens. So who, who has standing to appeal? People who have standing to appeal. Has anybody who has filed an objection to the settlement before the court? So there were the various dozens of parties and people who did that in uh, September, and anybody who did so now, they are entitled to appeal an approval of the settlement because they objected to it and the judge over uh, disregarded their objection. Thank you. Yes. This is a question from Sally Shannon. You have written eloquently that your members, of which I'm one, should opt out. That's my understanding of what you've written. You mentioned a catch-22 a few minutes ago. I'm wondering, I have wondered for a long time, why on our website there isn't a place to opt out? Well, well because you can't opt out on anybody's website except Google. A link. Yeah, it, well, there is a link. There is a link to the settlement documents on the document page. Um, we don't really say opt out. We say the organization that is fighting for you and all writers thinks this settlement is horse manure. <laughs> and I'm being, I'm being very ladylike. I try to be, I try to be ladylike here. You know, and not call it what I really think it is. It obviates so many of our basic rights that it's just objectionable on so many fronts. Let's not even go there. You all know what they are or you wouldn't be here. We will continue to fight on your behalf to get this overturned. But what we are saying is, you're the individual writer. You're, you still need to pay your bills and sell your books. We're fighting for you. You make the best decision for yourself that you think will help you and your career. And we don't want to force you to do what your organization is doing because we can fight together as a group more efficiently than one individual writer who is worried about the bills can fight. So while I would love it if everybody opt out, if it's financially better for you, you believe, to stay in so that your books are displayed, if you have out of print books, now if you have in print books, that's a different thing. If you have out of print books and there's a chance that your books will really be seen and get some attention and somebody might buy them, then you might want to stay in. And I don't think you're a bad person and disloyal to all writers. We make little money enough as it is. We struggle. Uh, I think that it is important to be clear that our objective is to fight for our rights and to say we think that, that Google and company are absconding with them. But Absolve Ote. You know, do what you think best. Well, 
it's it's one of the unfairnesses here is that we're all being forced to make this decision before we have any idea of what's really going to happen and, and that's you know aside from the fact that we all got those notices and we thought they were Nigerian spam <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I went to the website last summer I attempted to opt out and I found it so complicated so arduous yes. so difficult to understand that I just gave up now what's my recourse should I hire a lawyer <laughs> no, seriously well, you well, can still opt out. Oh, yeah, but there's so much bullshit to go through. If, if you can send a one-page letter, we have a sample form on our website at nwubook.org. Oh, okay. What's related to that? I, I just Thank opted you. out. I just went to Ms. Uh, Chu's page, and I took the took the, uh, the URL that she gave, and there's a, there's a much simpler form right now on that page is not hard to do. And I took I cut and pasted the little recommended uh, phrase that she had on her, on her site saying this applies to everything I've ever written. Um, well, let's pause and, here and, and have Lynn give her website. Yeah. Lynn, what's your website? Uh, www.writersreps.com. What is it? Writers Reps. Reps. R-E-P-S. A question that I think we've been sort of dancing around with, with this about the difficulty uh, we're all here, we talked about getting the emails, getting all the notices. There are still an awful lot of writers, especially outside of genre, who don't live online. I personally find this incomprehensible. <laughs> they don't, they're not familiar with the internet. They don't right. necessarily even have email, or if they do, they check it once a month. Um, who's, I mean, who's checking up with them? I mean, we said before, but they didn't send emails. They didn't, they didn't mail out registered letters. There is no way, as far as I can tell, unless you go online and download the paperwork to opt out or even to, to monitor your stuff. And there's right. this onus to be connected that seems to be comprehensible because there are people who don't have, you know, they're still on dial-up but they don't even have Write a Write a letter to the court and say that very thing. It's important that Joy and Chen hear that from us. But, but Laura, there, there's, there is, to the original uh, settlement, there was a really well done objection that outlines all of these problems with notification, all the problems with the class 32 thing. Do you remember the name? Um, I'm blanking on it, but uh, uh, it's been expressed to the judge. I don't know whether multiple times telling him makes more, uh, more makes more, more makes a difference, but it has <laughs> been, yeah, well, you can't well, hurt. eloquence does, I mean, you're all writers, so you know how to you know, use the written word and <laughs> Yeah, brief eloquence so is so always to powerful. A professor of mine who hadn't heard a thing about it. He's just not online, but he's yeah. got three books out there. Right. And he had no idea. Contract, you see, is opt-in inherently. There's no copyright license contract in the world that is not, you have to agree to it. That means someone has to come to you, and you have to sign on the dotted line. This process is built for other things. This process, the opt-out process, is built for class actions that have to do with things like mass torts, you know, like a big car crash, and you know everybody's going, you know, going to resolve a claim against, uh, you know, an asbestos, you know, polluter or something. Uh, things that can be just easily disposed of uh, through a pro rata share doesn't trample anybody's rights. This is just taking copyright and trashing it saying it's gone. Um, and it says that specifically in Article 10. <laughs> I mean, literally, it, it is waived as yeah. to Google. To glue that to a business deal and to everything that they might ever in the future do with your copyright is absolutely inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tim Shear at National Rights Union. And thank you for this wonderful, informative uh, program. I'd like to ask Sally Lynn, Lynn something I'm, I'm still unclear on. I've heard some people say that if I opt in with Google, I have two books out of print, two books in print. If I opt in for my out of print books, that I've given up my copyright. And I, I don't understand how I've given up my rights. It seems to me if I opt in, I'm giving them the right to sell, um, the right to read it. They're, they're going to sell it, your right to view it, you pay to view it online. It's not a download. Mm -hmm. Or to read snippets of it. Or, or to display it. I'm giving them a limited distribution of viewing. I don't see how I'm giving up my copyright. I don't 
understand that. Maybe, and it seems like people have been saying my copyright is destroyed or you waive okay, but a copyright understand. is a right to sue. Sorry, a, a copyright essentially is a right to sue. That's really all it is. So what for accounting, what would I sue them for? Infringement. If 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 a person is infring using your work and making money off of it, um. You know, you have the right to go to them and say, "Hey, you're using my work. I want to know how many, what sales, you know, what, how you've been using my work, and an accounting." So I have no rights then to ask them. So I opt in, and then a year from now, I'm not getting any money. You only have the registry. You may not address Google again except through the registry and through its arbitration process. So I go to an arbitrator, and I can work it out through an arbitrator. Hopefully right. yes. And you may or may not like the price that Google has put on your book. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, that too is something that's arbitrated. And if you think that your book should be, if you say it's in the best of all possible worlds, it's getting a lot of attention, and you think it should be selling for $12 in the Google Books Right Registry, and I put them together, the algorithm says that it would be more reasonable to sell it for $7 and you disagree, you have to go to arbitration. You, you don't control that. Yeah, and let's be clear, I think this is part of what you're asking. You waive the ability to audit Google. I mean, that's part right. of the deal. But you still cannot audit anybody. I still right. own my book. I can yep. still sell it online myself. I can sell an electronic download. I, if I can sell foreign rights, it's not like I've given up ownership of my work. Right, it's, it's a non-exclusive deal. I mean, you, right. can, you can do still do anything you want with exactly. your Exactly, yeah. Okay. But yeah. you've given up copyright in the sense that, as she said, you've given up the right to sue Google for infringement. And uh, you've given up the ability to um, uh, basically well, non-display rights. And all right. non-display rights are you Probably know, most non-display rights that they, that they would be using it for. Which we don't know what that is. That's you know technology that is yet to come. But there will be advantages that Google will get from having all these works uh, in their database that, that right. we won't be able to benefit from. They will benefit exclusively. You've also told them by opting in, you're giving them the exclusive right to bargain on mm -hmm. your behalf for all new electronic vehicles. Now. Two or three years ago, we didn't really know that Kindle was coming down the road. We had a, an idea that something like that would happen. Seems like every time I turn around, there's a new electronic device. We don't know what in two, five years down the road, what, what device will be carrying our words. But if you opt in, you're saying to them that, that you're giving them the exclusive right to bargain for you. Uh, for the sale of your work on uh, on those new devices forever in perpetuity. I thought I still had the right to sell it to other electronic publishers. I believe. Yeah, but I, the they, they, they just I think maybe I can, can can spin out the scenario. I think it's important people understand what the worst case scenario is if you opt in, and you're a good example. The worst case <laughs> scenario is you opt in. Your publisher you haven't heard from from years materializes because they see a good thing. And they say, well, actually, we've got this cockamamie interpretation of your contract that we actually still have rights. And because we've re-released it as print on demand, it's still in print. And so we're the sole rights holder. It says exclusive right to publish in book form. This is just another kind of book. So the publisher comes in and makes a claim and says, they and not you have all rights to the book. You go to arbitration, you lose. Now your book is up on Google for the exclusive benefit of Google and your ex-publisher. You have no control over that and you're getting zero revenue. Sure, you can bring out your own ebook edition in some other venue to compete with Google and your ex-publisher. But that's the position you're in is the best you can do is try to compete on your own with Google and your ex-publisher. And you can't sue either of them once you've lost one arbitration. That, that's the worst case scenario. Plus those future devices that we have no idea of what they're going to be. From Alex. Yes, hi. I'm Alexandra Owens of ASJ, I'm the executive director, and I have a point of information and a question. Um, Paul, because of, your, uh, Pete, because of your question, I went online and checked out the googlebooksettlement.com website, and there's a link to opt out right there. It's really not complicated. My question, though, is uh, something I've been asked, is that is it true that if you opt out, you object. You can't object that there is an advantage to opting in and turning off all rights 
Now, it, does opting in and turning off all rights mean that Google can't do anything with your work and you have standing to object? Ed is shaking his head. That's not correct? Well, it means that you can turn off all rights only if you're determined to be a rights holder who has those rights I under you, you the procedures and by the players to be named later. If you still have the potential conflict with, with any... You, you might still end up in the situation I just right, told right, Tim about. Right. James. But opting out, you have no standing even to object. That's right. It's right. just the, the fact that you've opted out that... Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting point. The SFWA has stayed in. We have several copyright right. properties so is our own. And we're staying in right. purely to object, because if we opted out, we couldn't. Right. Let's ask James has designed two things yeah. I've got to say. First, I want to say, you mentioned inability to control the price that Google charges Louder, for books. Please. She mentioned you mentioned the price inability to control the price that Google charges for books. That doesn't match my understanding of this element. Mm -hmm. Under Ed's worst case scenario, yes, you would have no ability to set the price on your own, but you're also getting your own money. If you are a rights holder, you can always at any point take your book out of settlement controlled pricing and choose your own price. In that price. instance, yes. Yes. Um, now, in terms of objection versus opting out, this is an artifact of our class action system. It's not well justified in theory. It comes out of a for fairly formalistic understanding of what a class action is. But yes, you can't both be a class member and object. However, uh, first thing to point out is that staying in and removing your book from all uses is not by itself going to look like an objection to the court. It will look like you are opting in and you approve of this and you're exercising your rights under the settlement. Mm -hmm. That's very The second thought is that the objections mostly matter to the court in terms of seeing the objections and seeing who has supported them. One option is to leave a single work of yours, perhaps just an insert in the settlement so that you're still a class member and object based on that but tell them you claim an opt-out for everything else. Well. Or to add your name to an objection filed by somebody else, right. saying that I have opted out, but I support this objection. Right. Okay. I just want to clarify, by the way, the whole opt-in thing versus opt-out is very confusing. Anybody who does nothing is in automatically. So please, for God's sake, don't go there and check opt-in, because what that means is you absolutely, affirmatively, consensually, individually agree to this 335-page contract that you cannot even read, you know, or that we, we, know have, we have no idea what, what effect it's going to have on your rights. My mama used to say, if you can't read it and understand it, for God's sakes, dear, don't sign it. <laughs> Ursula Le Guin's pe petition, I should note, is open to everybody, including people who've opted out. So that's a way to get your name before the judge as someone who doesn't like this, even if you're opting out. And there's a link to that, again, from nwubook.org, or if you can spell her name, at UrsulaKLeGuin.com. Book View Cafe had her original. Right, that's her. And they have it. It's a little harder to find it there. It's on her homepage if you go to UrsulaKLeGuin.com. I have a really simple question. And um, I, I've been working on my novel, so I haven't been able to do the research on this. And I keep running across the figure $60 for a novel, $30 for an excerpt. What exactly does that mean? Is 15. It, yeah, it's 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. Okay, the, what well, does that mean? Uh, any book that is that claim that you, if you opt in, you'll get these per title uh, payments. If it's a full book, or if you have a selection in somebody else's book, and you can cite that, you'll get 15 bucks. It's their way of giving you a bonus toaster you and trying to suck you in. After the publisher gets but yeah, that's, that's yeah. something important. <laughs> you pay it, they will pay it, to, if the book has not been reverted, they will pay it to the publisher. The publisher will take half. Or whatever book they want to take. And, well, all right. And yeah, optimistically, the publisher. This is a minimum will, no, 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 The publisher automatically gets hit. And you automatically get hit. I just read this, so I'm pretty sure. Right. Uh, and then, of your half, the publisher looks at your contract and see, sees if there are uh, rights distribution percentages, then you get percent. And like, so it was 50% in your contract, you get $15 of that 60. So, <laughs> then, if, now, are, now, are you saying that? Basically, it's I get a payment if the amount owed me reaches that amount. Is that what no, you're no, talking no. about? If your book has been scanned, 
prior to May 5th, 2009, you get that money. Well, that's that's, Somebody that's, your, that's, money. that's, that's, that's the reward they're giving you for scanning your work uh, against your will. There are two pieces to the money falling in the settlement. One of them is the let's make up for past harms for scanning your book. The other is the big ambitious <laughs> let's hope and let's revolutionize the publishing industry payments. You're guaranteed the let's make up for past harm payment or the author publisher combination is guaranteed them. The other money, the so-called inclusion fees and the royalty splits, all of those only arise if this whole program actually achieves flight. And I think it's five five years. Years. It achieves it takes off. It, have, uh, oh, it, it could yes. be that six people and one publisher actually have their books available through this, and the whole program is too small to be justified continuing. Now they're about to God's ear. Go ahead. I have two books with a collaborator. We share the copyright. So do we both have to opt out for that? That's a Good question. I'm, trying to puzzle. Well, I, I'm in that situation. My interpretation of it is if either one opts out, either one of the collaborators opts out, it's out. then it's out. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Same thing as with, between the author and publisher. If only one, an author opts out, it's out. You know, regardless of Right. If any, if any of the rights holders opt out, then it's out. Right. That, that would be an interesting situation if the collaborators disagree. Yeah, well, exactly. yes, and there's provisions in the settlement as to how to resolve that. You're supposed to amicably resolve that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got, we'll take one last question, and then we have time to talk with each other and stick around if people like. Uh, Ed, on, on your uh, FAQ, you said that if you make a claim, even if you never get any money, you will give up some rights and you will give Google an irrevocable license to use your work in certain ways, some of them without payment. Now, I filed a claim three blessed years ago for about 150 contributions to periodicals, some of which were reprinted in books, most of which I have registered with the Copyright Office. How is it that filing a claim to say I oppose the infringement gives Google an irrevocable license to infringe my copyright? I trust that that's a rhetorical question. No, 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 this is sort of a weird aspect of the way that the class action lawsuits work. There's buys or falls. You're out to this. Is. Um, this is sort of a weird aspect of the way yeah. that class If you made a claim, your that by default, or if you do not, um, then you are part of the class and you're bound um, by whatever you know, is agreed to by the lawyers your for the class. Now the lawyers who are representing me are going to claim to represent us. And you're bound us. by whatever. Okay. Is it you to make a claim or do nothing? Or the class. You're bound the by that. And then the authors will claim to represent under all this. Okay. Settlement. If you make a claim or do nothing, is giving you're bound by that. To the the default, a certain kind of license. under this and giving up settlement thing. Is that so everybody in the class? Is giving to yes, Google. I mean, I'm not going to certain kind of license. license and I'm giving up a for it. Certain so things. So, so that's I mean, just in effect, I opted. That's the problem. Yes, that's right. That's the way it is. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm not going to offer you know. I'm a for it. That's the way it is. So, by filing a claim, so in effect, I opted to do it. Yes, that's right. If you do nothing, you're also getting no money. I mean, if you file a claim, at least you might get some money. I think publicly, the worst thing you could possibly do is do nothing. You'll get no money and gain no benefits. I think you can, if you want to reverse that, you can opt out of it. And does that mean I'm very confident? Yes. 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 You can opt out prior yes. to January 28th. It's a big red letter day. January 28th. Very close. One more week. One more week. One more week if you want to change your decision. <laughs> yes, you get it. It effectively withdraws your claim if you opt out. Now, something I wanted to make clear, and, and, and this hasn't been said, this is sort of what Paul would probably say to you. And I was going to read the whole thing again. <clears throat> if you uh, opt in and you 
you have the right to remove all your works from the Google database if you do it before something like May 2011. In other words, you have one year to get your stuff completely out of their database. At least that's what it says. I, I can see that might be an option for some people, but you're still signing in to the rest of the provisions of the, uh, of the settlement, which right. may or may Again, not. I want to come to you on the aspects of that. Thing our three organizations are going to be doing together. And one of the main things you can do around the Google, the Google Book Settlement is join, if you haven't, one of these organizations. You can see Akil and Ramona in the back for the National Writers Union. If you join today, you get the Freelance Writers Guide. We have free. And I hope people can stick around and talk a little bit.